Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Stillman here. And today we are going to be talking about dopamine, genetics, nutrition, how they affect you and what they mean for you. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because it has a lot to do with how I help people. Most of the people I'm dealing with, when you look at how they behave, have got trouble with some of their um, dopamine dependent functions. And so I pay a lot of attention to the neuroscience behind dopamine. But one thing that I'll tell you all right off the bat is that a lot of what you hear about dopamine is being, um, it's being promulgated and, and explained by people who don't actually work with patients or in the coaching business clients. And what that means is that they often have a great map of how dopamine works, but they don't actually understand the territory of how dopamine works. And the difference between the map and the territory is something, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about today, but basically it's one thing to understand the theory and the science behind this. It's a completely different animal to understand how this actually plays out in clinical practice, which is why I want to give you some idea of how things actually work today in our masterclass. So without further ado, we're starting today with an excellent paper by one of my favorite authors. Her name is Nora Volkow. Nora Volkow has been working in the addiction literature for maybe longer than I've been alive. Uh, at least since I was in medical school and shortly after residency, I've been running across her work in multiple different areas because she's one of the top authors in this field. And the key thing that this paper uh, uh, tells us and that I want you guys to understand about dopamine is that it has a lot to do with reward and addiction. You've probably heard that before. But the number one thing I want people to understand about all this is that you're going to hear things from different people about how light affects dopamine and nutrition affects dopamine and your genetic and your social milieu affect dopamine and all these things. And the key for you to understand is that it's not one thing that's going to make or break something as complicated as dopamine. Okay. So in this paper, it's really important too for us to rem remember that, you know, dopamine signaling is involved in addiction. And I don't work a lot directly with people who have drug addictions. I do have some patients and I've had patients in my practice who've got drug addictions, but most of my patients are still dealing with and struggling with issues with um, craving behavior and what they might call addiction or, or at least close to addiction. Uh, they're struggling with issues like, say, pornography use. They're struggling with issues like alcohol use. They can't quit the carbs. They can't quit the soda. They can't quit the video games. And they wonder why. And the search for why leads us to understanding or questioning, okay, what's really going on under the hood here? And that's where this neuroscience of drug addiction and reward really comes in. And what they say in this paper is that drug consumption is driven by a drug's pharmacological effects, which are experienced as rewarding and is influenced by genetic, developmental, and psychosocial factors that mediate drug accessibility, norms, and social support systems or lack thereof. That's a very, very big statement. And what that means for me functionally in my practice, even though I'm not dealing predominantly with people who have uh, drug or alcohol addiction issues, is that whatever we're trying to get under control as their behavior uh, we have to look at all these different factors in order to help them understand how to change their life and their lifestyle and their diet so that they can get that behavior under control because those behaviors are often driving the symptoms of there's disease that they're coming to me for help with. We're going to talk a lot today about brain fog. So if you have brain fog, listen up and sharpen your pencils because this video is definitely for you. If you have problems with focus, with mental clarity, with working memory, we're going to talk about all of that today, and I'm going to help you understand some of the secrets that I use in my practice to help people understand these things better for themselves so that they can get better outcomes. Now, the thing about doing things that are rewarding, in other words, stimulate the dopaminergic tract or, or areas in the brain, as this paper says here, the reinforcing effects of drugs mostly depend upon dopamine signaling in the nucleus accumbens. Chronic drug exposure triggers glutamatergic mediated neuroadaptations in dopamine striatothalamal cortical uh, regions, including blah, 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 and limbic pathways, the amygdala and hippocampus. And in vulnerable individuals, this can result in addiction. Okay. That's a loaded term right there. But the bottom line there is simply this. If you've, if you are using anything that stimulates dopamine, you're basically, and the way I explain it to patients is you can either increase the dopamine in the brain or in the body in general. Cause remember a lot of dopamine is not actually made in the brain. A lot of people forget that. 
And the reason that's important, by the way, is that if you're using a lot of dopamine in other organ systems, how are you going to have enough raw materials left over in order to make and have optimal dopamine levels in the brain? That's why we'll fix someone's process in the body that may be consuming dopamine or its, its metabolites or precursors, and all of a sudden their brain fog will go away. I didn't necessarily treat their brain. I treated something else, and all of a sudden they're sharper, more focused, have less brain fog, have more working memory. But I digress. Okay. So whatever you're using that basically stimulates dopamine, that's one of the ways that you can get more dopamine in the system and get that reward. But what happens when you use this and overuse this is that people wind up getting less and less effect, right? And that's where we want to focus on what can we do in order to support levels of dopamine so that you don't have to constantly stimulate its release. That's how I think about it. That's that map is not the territory thing. Okay, so complexity of dopamine metabolism. Dopamine metabolism is wildly, wildly complex. And one of the things that I want you guys to understand about this, and I don't want to spend too long on this paper, is that while dopamine metabolism is really, really complex, honestly, I don't think most of the people writing about it are doing justice to the fact that while it's complex, what you can do as a everyday person is optimize your diet and your lifestyle and your environment in order to have optimal dopamine levels. Okay. This, by the way, is, an, is the paper where I, I wanted to bring up this point I just made. Although dopamine is an important neurotransmitter in the brain, a substantial part of the overall dopamine in the body is produced outside the brain by mesenteric organs and mesenteric organs. So if you're dealing with problems that are linked to low dopamine in the brain, your problem may actually be outside the brain itself. That's been my experience with many, many patients. Okay, here's a nice little schematic of dopamine production. Here's another one. You see that phenylalanine and tyrosine feed forward into dopamine production. What are they not showing you on this screen that drives me insane? They are not showing all of the minerals and vitamins that are essential for dopamine production. They pay lip service to biopterin, which is important, but there are many, many more micronutrients that are essential here. I could spend an entire hour unpacking just the nutrients that are necessary for dopamine uh, production and signaling. One of them, or another one that's really important is NAD and NADH, which is where B vitamins, niacin, things like that are really, 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 really important. Okay. One of the most interesting papers that I reviewed today for this masterclass is this one. So working memory capacity predicts dopamine synthesis capacity in the human striatum. One of the reasons I picked this paper to share with you guys is that my experience, again, the map is not the territory, my real lived experience in taking care of people and trying to alter their dopamine levels is absolutely that when we get things right and we're supporting dopamine production with the right nutrition and the right um, daily routine and things like that, is that they see massive improvements in things like working memory, mental clarity, their ability to focus, stuff like that. Which again, I don't see people really unpacking the way I think they need to in the health and wellness info space. They, they often talk about one or two things, but they don't really address all the different factors. Although to be fair, I'm not gonna do that today either. I don't have the time, it's way too complicated. Oh, and by the way, I am gonna be having a a webinar on this uh, coming up soon. If you want more info on that, make sure you're on my email list at stillmanwellness.com and or my Substack, both ideally, uh, because I haven't made the link to that yet, so I can't share it with you. But people who are on the list get access to our free uh, weekly webinars, which are the bomb. And once they're done live, and they're not streamed to any of these platforms, so you're not going to get it on YouTube, you're not going to get it on LinkedIn, you're not going to get it on Twitter. You have to be on the list in order to get access to it. And if you miss out, it's going to be behind the paywall in one of our courses. So you would be crazy, in my opinion, not to be on our list, if only for those. They're almost every Thursday at 10 o'clock Eastern. But anyway, all right, from this paper, dopamine receptor agents have opposite effects on cognitive function, depending on baseline levels of working memory. Okay. So um, here we demonstrate that for the first time, for the first time that working memory capacity as measured by listening span predicts dopamine synthesis capacity in the striatum, indicating that subjects with low working memory capacity have low dopamine synthesis capacity in the striatum, whereas subjects with high working memory capacity have high dopamine synthesis capacity in the striatum, okay? 
So what they're saying here is that your dopamine synthesis capacity has real world clinical correlations. Your perception of working memory and your ability to pay attention depend upon this. And yes, it's modifiable. Okay. This is something that more and more people are appreciating because of guys like Andrew Huberman who go out and pound the table about how important it is to pay attention to your light environment. Um, however, I think there's a lot more to this step to this story than most people are still aware of. So this uh, paper, the role of the circadian system in the etiology and pathophysiology of ADHD, time to redefine ADHD was really interesting. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD is highly associated with delayed sleep phase disorder, a circadian rhythm sleep wake disorder, which is prevalent in 73 to 78% of children and adults with ADHD. Improvement of sleep quality, quantity, and phase resetting by means of improving sleep hygiene, chronotherapy, treatment of specific sleep disorders, and by strengthening certain neural networks involved in sleep, et cetera, uh, may have a lot, of, a lot to offer these people. Ultimately, the main question is addressed whether ADHD needs to be redefined. We propose a novel view of ADHD where a part of the ADHD symptoms are the result of chronic sleep disorders with most evidence for the delayed circadian rhythm as the underlying mechanism. This substantial subgroup should receive treatment of the sleep disorder in addition to ADHD symptom treatment. I'm not going to belabor all the different things they cover in this paper because you guys probably hear me talk about a lot of this stuff, so it's not news to you. The thing I want you to realize is that they're asking this question of, is ADHD just the product of a bad sleep environment? a dysfunctional light environment with lots of artificial light at night. One of the big problems with the whole idea behind ADHD prevalence and severity is that we've really only studied this disease in detail in a world that's abundantly really inundated with artificial light at night. So I ask you, what is really normal human behavior? I don't think the people looking at this study or this topic have truly quantified that because they don't they're pretty far behind the curve on how to actually use light uh, clinically. Um, that may sound kind of harsh, but you know, a lot of these people have only woken up to how powerful light is in the last couple of years. Uh, some of us were ahead of the curve on that one. And there's a lot more that people are not talking about that's still clinically relevant that we help people with in our coaching programs and in my medical practice. But anyway, how much of ADHD may be totally related to light? I think it's a great question. I think it's a very important question. And that's part of why it gets so easy for us to help people deal with their lives when we get their light environment right with blue blockers and with abundant light during the day hitting their eye and not using things like sunglasses. Okay, retinal dopamine and melatonin, a very interesting uh, connection. So the IPRGCs, I forget what that stands for, but they're cells, uh, they're, they're cells that are in the eye, have connections with the amacrine cells that produce, oh, we just dropped out. What happened there? going on that's really weird my uh my adobe acrobat software just completely quit on me which is really annoying because i spent a lot of time setting that up um, now i have to open all these papers again and we're in a very specific order for me to go over them. And now Adobe Acrobat is not working right. Okay, I think we're back in action. Wow, that is so irritating. There's nothing I can do about it. So hopefully these papers are in order again. We're going to jump back in. Okay, where was I? I was talking about retinal dopamine and melatonin. Okay, so retinal dopamine dysfunctioning has been hypothesized to play a role in the regulation of neurodevelopmental growth of the eye leading to refractive errors, which may explain the increased prevalence of refractive errors that were found in ADHD. Translation, the light hitting your eye and the chemicals it has to interact with at the eye or in the eye 
will affect how your eye grows. This is part of why we see so much more visual disturbance, people needing glasses uh, in plain language. In our modern world where we've got lots of air pollution that is reducing the amount of light hitting the earth, we've got tons and tons of light pollution at night, we've got an altered diet, all kinds of things are con con colluding or coming together in order to wreck these pathways, right? And the corollary to that, by the way, is if you lead a more uh, natural life with more natural light in your eye, with more natural food, with healthier habits, arguably you're gonna have fewer issues with your eyes. We've certainly seen that. My friend Jay Montgomery, who's an ophthalmologist, and I totally agree on that, and that's what he's seeing in his practice. Interestingly, ADHD is considered a neuro neurodevelopmental disorder that is associated with low dopamine levels in certain brain areas, and the retina is basically an outgrowth of brain tissue. I don't think enough people think about their eyes as an outgrowth of their brain, but that's exactly what they are. So whatever hits your eye arguably is hitting your brain. The dopaminergic DRD4 gene is heavily involved in converting light to electrical signals in the retina and its transcription exhibits a strong circadian pattern in rodents. Translation, this dopaminergic DRD4 gene is really critical for turning light that hits your eye into electrical signals that go into your brain. Wow. If you've never stopped to think about the fact that light hitting your eye creates an electrical signal that goes into your brain, I want you to stop and think about it because that has profound impacts. The light that hits your eye programs the brain that you think is your own, okay? And that's why I'm so against artificial light at night use, and I see it just destroying people's brain function. Now, this gene exhibits a strong circadian pattern. What does that mean? If you're gonna disrupt these patterns with living living a, light, a, a, a life at night with lots of artificial light, you can expect problems with this system. And that is indeed what we see clinically. It's also what we see in the literature if you really dig into it. So the DRD47R allele is one of the proposed genetic risk factors for ADHD. It's one of the ones I've been looking at right now. I'm reading this book by a guy named Doug Brackman called Driven that's been very insightful into this. But again, I don't want you guys to focus on the genes because I actually asked Doug this. I said, hey, you know, should I be getting my patient's dopamine testing? And he said, no. And the reason, or he said, I said gene testing, to be clear. And he said, no, because the thing is there's hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands, I don't know how many different things that affect this. And so it matters much more how the patient is and not what their genes are. The genes, as some of us like to say, are predisposition, not predestination. And that's a really important um, caveat because you, you can't blame your genes for these things. So carriers of the 7R genotype have less ability to reduce the light sensitive second messenger cyclic adenosine monophosphate level with illumination. Translation, uh, people with different genes are going to react differently to light. So some, and this is where a lot of patients get confused, like Dr. Stillman, my husband wears blue blockers and he just goes right to sleep and I wear blue blockers and I just don't see that much of a difference. To be fair, almost no one tells me they don't see a big difference with blue blockers, but that's an example of something that people would say to me where they don't see as big a difference with other people. You're all unique. Your genes are different. Your environment's different. Your prior experiences, your lived experiences are different. Your neural circuitry as a result of that are different. So never make the mistake of, of making your, of comparing your experience to someone else's. You need to really make sure that you understand that that's going to be different from person to person. Dopamine and melatonin have opposing roles in the regulation of the circadian rhythm. While dopamine is mainly synthesized and released in the early morning and during the day, melatonin is released in the late afternoon or early evening and peaks at night. Dopamine has an inhibitory effect on melatonin release and vice versa. Okay. Do I think it's a coincidence that when you look at people who live an artificially lit, a, a life of artificial light at night, do I think it's a, a coincidence that they have low dopamine and behaviors associated with that? And then their sleep is destroyed, which would be associated with low melatonin? No. And this is why one of the first things we start people with when they join a coaching program or join the practice is get outside three times a day for three 10 minute walks and wear blue blockers at night because it fixes a ton, a ton of problems. Okay. So I'm not going to belabor that anymore. Um, it's an interesting paper, but you know, I think a lot of you follow me know it all too well. This was a really interesting paper that I stumbled across while I was preparing this. The effect of parasitic infection on dopamine biosynthesis 
in dopaminergic cells. It's a fancy way of saying what happens to your brain when it's got parasites. So infection by the neurotropic agent Toxoplasma gondii alters rodent behavior and can result in neuropsychiatric symptoms in humans. Translation, when we see people clinically who've got parasitic infections, one of the side effects of those parasites is that their behavior will be altered. And one of the big questions is why would someone with an infection have altered behavior? We have previously reported elevated levels of dopamine in infected dopaminergic cells. However, the involvement of the host enzymes and the fate of the produced dopamine were not defined. And what they found in this study that they did was that although the levels of host tyrosine hydroxylase and dopa decarboxylase did not change significantly in infected cultures, dopa decarboxylase was found within the parasitoph parasitophorus vacuole. Parasitoph paras yeah, whatever. The vacuolar compartment where the parasites reside, as well as in the host cytosol and infected dopaminergic cells. Strikingly, dopa decarboxylase was found within the intracellular parasite cyst and infected brain tissue. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. What I want you guys to take away from this is pretty simple. When parasites are in brain tissue, they're altering how you handle things like dopamine. And this is why when people come to me and we put them on antiparasitics, oftentimes they see very profound behavioral changes. Now, not all of these people have clinically documented parasitic infections, but this gets back to that point I made earlier about the map is not the territory. And I guess I, I've mentioned that so many times here, I feel like I have to um, I have to explain a little bit more, especially in this context. So what you're going to find is a certain number of people who you treat with antiparasitic herbs, and I prefer herbs over drugs for the record, will have profound improvements in many different areas of their health. Uh, regardless of what they seem to eliminate in terms of like parasite burden, because I do think that the burden of parasites in modern people is rather overblown uh, by some people anyway. And so the question is, how is this affecting them? And is it affecting them by say cleaning out parasites that have not been identified in them clinically? I don't really know what the answer is. And I could go on about that for a lot longer than I will today, but the map is not the territory in this case basically means we may see neuropsychiatric symptoms from parasitic infections. And when we treat them, we may see that people get better in terms of their behavior and how they feel. And that's a big win for the patient. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be documented on laboratory exam if you're going to use something that's mild, like say herbs, which again is my preference. All right. What about nutrition? Okay. I love talking about nutrition. You guys all know that. Um, one thing that I talked about recently, I did a master, well, I did a, um, I did a webinar on this last week is on iron and, and secrets of blood donation and iron toxicity. So iron and dopamine have a really interesting relationship. When you basically, when you combine iron and dopamine in the brain in high levels, you'll see an increase in oxidative stress from this paper, iron and dopamine, a toxic couple. Although an elevation in brain iron levels is a normal feature of aging, the increase is greater in Parkinson's disease. On the other hand, the effects of the disease are most marked in the nigrostriatal dopaminergic system. Um, neurodegeneration in the affected regions may result from the potent redox couple formed by iron and dopamine itself and discuss the clinical implications of this molecular trait in this dynamic and rapidly moving area of Parkinson's disease research. Translation, combine too much iron with too much dopamine in an aging brain and you get a recipe for Parkinson's disease. And that's why you know I'm a big fan of managing your iron status with blood donation. Um, but in the next couple of papers, I'm going to talk about why you really can go overload overboard with that and why uh, and how I caution people on, on when or, or when not to donate blood. But this, I think, is a, a massively underappreciated element of um, people's uh, brain health problems today. Like I see people who go donate blood. A lot of them say their brain fog gets better. They're better able to focus. They have more energy. They feel better. Their mood may be better. I think that's a really big, big piece of wellness in our modern world. Okay, early iron deficiency has brain behavioral effects consistent with dopaminergic dysfunction. So I just mentioned the fact that too much iron in the brain along with dopamine will contribute to, we now believe, this increased risk of Parkinson's disease, right, which you all want to avoid, right? But here is a paper showing that iron deficiency can really create a lot of dopaminergic dysfunction and problems. So children and young adults who had iron deficiency anemia in infancy showed poorer inhibitory control and executive functioning as assessed by neurocognitive 
tasks where pharmacologic and neuroimaging studies implicate frontostriatal circuits and the mesocortical dopamine pathway. Translation, iron deficiency anemia in infancy showed that these kids then had, had long-term changes in this neural circuitry that's dependent upon dopamine. Uh, alterations in the mesolimbic pathway where dopamine plays a major role in behavioral activation and inhibition, positive affect, and inherent reward may help explain altered social emotional behavior in iron deficient infants, specifically wariness and hesitance, lack of positive affect, diminished social engagement, etc. Translation, this may explain why iron deficient infants behave differently than iron sufficient infants, which is part of why I'm so enthusiastic about women getting their nutrition right before they get pregnant and long before they get pregnant. Poorer motor sequencing and bimanual coordination and lower spontaneous eye blink rate in iron deficient anemic infants are consistent with impaired function in the nigrostriatal pathway. Again, real changes in people, children, infants with this iron deficiency linked to this dopaminergic pathway. The persistence of poor cognitive motor effective and sensory system functioning highlights the need to prevent iron deficiency in infancy and to find interventions that lessen the long-term effects of this widespread nutrient disorder. Now, I've talked frequently about how I think the, the diagnosis of iron deficiency is overblown, and I think a lot of clinicians and patients are therefore are missing a lot of other factors contributing to iron handling that are arguably more important, or at least as important as iron sufficiency. But all that being said, it's really sad to me that we live in a society where increasingly people are malnourished and this is creating a society of people who are not as intelligent and who are more susceptible to, uh, frankly, to manipulation and more susceptible to addiction. And that makes them more uh, easily controlled. And one of the things we want to help you and empower you to do is to be more independent, uh, more critically thinking, uh, more, um, we want to help you optimize your dopamine so that you are an independent, sovereign, intelligent human being. And that means optimizing your nutrition. So get on my email list at someonewellness.com because that's where you get the real sauce on that. All right, tyrosine, phenylalanine, and catecholamine synthesis and function in the brain. It's a really cool paper. I really like uh, these two authors who I, I, read, I read a bunch of papers from them on this. And uh, I think they must be related based on the names. And they published a lot and they've been publishing for a while. So... One of the big questions, right, that I think a lot of people just fly past is, okay, so we've established that low dopamine levels lead to all these problems, right? Reward deficiency syndrome, the wandering gene, horizoning, addiction, all these things, right, are linked to dopamine, sleep-wake cycle disorders, et cetera. However, what makes dopamine? Tyrosine, phenylalanine, these aromatic amino acids, as well as vitamins and minerals. So it begs the question, what happens when you increase the supply of the raw ingredients to levels of the uh, neurotransmitters? So from this paper titled Tyrosine, Phenylalanine, and Catecholamine Synthesis and Function in the Brain, unlike almost all other neurotransmitter biosynthetic pathways, the rates of synthesis of serotonin and catecholamines in the brain are sensitive to local substrate concentrations, particularly in the ranges normally found in vivo. Translation. How much dopamine you make is dependent upon how much precursor you have. And this is particularly true in the ranges of these nutrients that are found in actual living, breathing human beings. As a consequence, physiologic factors that influence brain pools of these amino acids, notably diet, influence their rates of conversion to neurotransmitter products with functional consequences. Translation. Okay. Things that change the availability of these amino acids and or the precursors and coenzymes and, and cofactors that allow them to be transformed into these neurotransmitters, i.e. what you eat and the supplements you take, influence their rates of conversion to neurotransmitter products. And that means that what you eat really does affect how your brain functions in a very direct and very significant way. And this in turn affects how you function. That means functional consequences, okay? Elevating brain tyrosine concentration stimulates catecholamine production, an effect exclusive to actively firing neurons. Increasing the amount of protein ingested acutely or chronically raises brain tyrosine concentrations and stimulates catecholamine synthesis. One single protein-rich meal can make the difference in how your brain functions. Do not underestimate that. We start people with one protein at each meal. 
And this is just amazing. The other thing I really like about this paper that they included is they also did some studies where they looked at the effects of this with light or darkness. So this is in rats. Remember, rats are nocturnal. You're not rats. You're not nocturnal. So it doesn't apply to you the same way. But the point here is merely that light does trigger and affect the synthesis of dopamine. Okay, so you look at the serum tyrosine level. This is in, in the vehicle. It refers to the uh, rats that got the vehicle, not the tyrosine. So the light tyrosine group and the dark tyrosine group received a tyrosine supplement. So look at these numbers in serum tyrosine. Stark differences between both the group exposed to light and not exposed. And then in those that got the tyrosine and did not get the tyrosine. Same thing with retinal concentrations of tyrosine. You see that here as well. And the same thing with retinal dopa, because dopa is what tyrosine eventually gets trans, uh, uh, transformed into and then finally gets translated downstream into dopamine. Okay, so these are really, really important trends and really important fa factors. Here's the effect of ingesting a single protein meal on tyrosine levels and tyrosine hydroxylation rates in light exposed rats only. So food deprived, look at that. And the, the carbohydrate rich meal, same, the same number almost, practically speaking. The protein-rich meal, they had triple the amount of tyrosine in the serum. Maybe that's, no, that's triple. Amazing, right? Retinal tyrosine, massive improvement. Retinal dopa, massive improvement. So people are wandering around taking supplements and energy drinks and doing biohacks and doing all this crazy stuff. And some of these people are not even getting two, three, four milligrams of tyrosine a day in their diet. Silly, very silly. We help these people get back on track by actually getting them the dopamine they need from the tyrosine in their diet by giving them a high enough protein diet. All right. Another important point that I want to make to you guys, okay? And that's that dop iron deficiency alters dopamine transporter functioning in the rat stratum. So again, I talk a lot about iron. It's more There's more of it in my book. If you want to read more about that, buy my book, Dying to be Free, available for sale, Amazon.com. Um, I mentioned that iron deficiency in infancy affects these pathways permanently, which is why it's so important for women to get their nutrition right before they conceive. I mentioned how iron overload we're now seeing it contributes to neurodegeneration, specifically Parkinson's disease. Well, what about iron deficiency? Now, iron deficiency, I'll just mention for the record, it's I, I have I have yet. I've only seen it in women who are having very heavy periods in our modern world. And the vast majority of people who I see with a iron deficiency, even the women who are have a having heavy menses, they also tend to have problems with some combination of B vitamins and therefore methylation. Uh, methylation, by the way, plays into biotin. Biotin plays into dopamine synthesis. I didn't have time to prep anything on that, but it's important. So it's almost never just one thing. And iron overload, bad, yes. Iron deficiency in infancy, bad, yes. But iron deficiency now and or the inability to mobilize iron properly because of something like a copper or a vitamin A deficiency are also important. So what happens when you iron restrict rats, okay, which is what they did in this study? Iron deficiency alters dopamine transporter functioning in rat striatum. Iron deficiency did not alter the affinity of the ligand for the dopamine transporter, but did significantly decrease the density of the transporter by 30% in the caudate putamen and 20% in the nucleus accumbens. Iron deficiency also significantly decreased dopamine uptake into striatal synaptosomes. Translation, iron deficiency results in less dopamine access to the transporter that pushes it around and less dopamine uptake. So what does that tell you? You can have normal levels of dopamine, but if you don't have the right mineral balance, i.e. iron status, you will not have that dopamine in the right place at the right time. It won't be able to move. These experiments provide supporting evidence that elevated levels of extracellular dopamine in the striatum of iron deficient rats is likely to be the result of decreased DAT functioning and not increased rates of release. Again, I feel like a broken record. The bottom line is you've got to eat the right diet for you. You've got to have a proper management of your iron balance, and then things fall into place. I mean, among other things, right? And this is why the last paper we're going to talk about, I'm not surprised when people get results with X39 patches for some of these problems, okay? So why would a patch that you put on your skin have an impact on something like dopamine or dopamine-related symptoms, Okay. The reason is that what this product is doing is it's upregulating or it's 
triggering the release of GHKCU in human cells through phototherapy. So what happens then? GHKCU scavenges copper, alters gene expression, changes what's going on in cells, triggers things like, you know, um, fibroblast expression and alters your, you know, inflammatory cascades, does all kinds of things to promote what I look at as rest, rejuvenation, and regeneration of cells and tissues, right? Some of those things include rest, repair, and renovation of things that then affect dopamine. So I'm not surprised when people come to me and they say, yeah, I tried these patches and my brain fog got better or my focus got better or my son's mood is better. I've gotten all kinds of different testimonials to that, right? And this is why I'm not surprised when in this paper they use this. And this was a double-blinded study for the record. They see improvements in short-term memory, sleep quality, vitality uh, at, at day seven in people who are using the patches, right? That's a really big deal, all right? The study showed that there was an improvement in short-term memory as measured by the WAIS-3 memory test at significant levels over seven days, in quality of sleep at significant levels within 24 hours, and a self-reported increase in vitality at near significant levels in seven days as measured by the Arizona Integrative Outcomes Scale. So this is why I like LifeWave patches. This is why I use them every day. It's why I hand them out to my patients, uh, particularly the people who are in our executive uh, and concierge um, physical and wellness program. You can apply for consultation through my link tree. You can also learn more about LifeWave patches and try them for yourselves through the links in my bio or bio link tree. The link tree below here has got all these links. Um, and so you can check out more and learn more about this product. You can see if it's right for you, order it, check it out, try it. Um, I think that's it for today, everyone. Uh, we got webinars coming up every Thursday. Make sure you're on our list at stillmanwellness.com to get updates for those. As always, take care, everyone. Have a great day. Oh, and I almost forgot. If you are a premium subscriber uh, to my Substack, stillmanmd.substack.com, you get access to a weekly Q&A with me after the masterclass. A Zoom invite comes to your inbox with a recording of this uh, if you're on that list. And if you're not on uh, my Substack, and, and if you're not a premium subscriber, you still get a link uh, to the Monday masterclass where I'm unpacking really important topics every Monday at uh, 3 or 3.30 depending on when I get done prepping the video. So as always, everyone, again, thanks for watching. Take care. Have a great day. Don't forget to get outside.